this cup sent me down an absolute rabbit hole. Future half plastic, half human Ashley has literally ripped, I have ripped this room apart. She can't get in my greenhouse yet because there's still snow in front of it. But, and we're not talking like an Alice in Wonderland acid trip that was enjoyable. No, 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 no. I can't sleep at night. So the Geek Crew, you guys are coming along with me. The video was supposed to be about using solo cups to start your plants and or bump your plants up into, because these are really popular to do that with. As you guys know, this is a science-based channel. So what I do every time is I look up studies, journals, experiments, lab field results, you name it, to try to figure out an answer somewhere in the middle. I'm pretty unbiased. I don't say like, this is the absolute way, that's the absolute way. I'm kind of like, whatever, do what you want. <clears throat> Plastics, plastic. That sent me down a rabbit hole into what this is made out of, what these ones from Walmart are made out of, what these hard plastic ones are made of, what these nursery pots are made out of, what fertilizers come in, literally down the hole. So today, today we're gonna discuss um, plastic, plastic just in general and using it with your plants. Is it safe to use? Which ones are safe to use? Which ones you should absolutely just stay away from? And some of these are shocking. Let's start the story with whether or not plants can uptake micro and now what we call nanoplastics, because there's two types. Yes, they can. It's a very short, simple answer. Now you're probably wondering how? How do they uptake them? And I'm not gonna lie, some of these actually shocked me. So there's four ways in which people, scientists, believe plants are uptaking microplastics. So number one is endocytosis. There's apoplastic transport, crack entry, Again, not the good kind. And then also stomatal entry. So just to break those down for you. Roots. Roots uptake it. They put them into the biomass, upper biomass, lower biomass. The plastics are found in the, the roots, the shoots, the stems, the leaves, the fruits, you name it, all equally pretty much dispersed throughout the entire kit and caboodle, meaning it's mobile in the plant as well. And so it's just put on over time um, from when the seedlings baby all the way to when it's adult. It just continues to accumulate plastic. The last one was the one where I was like, what, are you serious? And that is stomata. So stomata, you've heard me talk about this before, but what it is is that it's a hole on the bottom of the leaf. And now the stomata is regulated by guard cells, which kind of look like lips and the lips close and open, whatever, uh, based on triggers and what the plant tells it to do, loosely speaking. Now that is where plastics go through, is through the hole. Pun intended. The plants are gonna have a me too movement. That's out of the way, plants uptake. So then my next thought, is okay, fine, plants can uptake it, but the studies varied in how the plants were exposed to it. And really common, very common conversation in these studies was that the plants were grown in contaminated, plastic contaminated soil, meaning it was soil that we knew needed to be reclaimed and had an abundance of micro and nanoplastics present. Now, some studies weren't that way, but a majority were. So then I thought to myself, I have to look at how it moves in the soil because you guys have heard me speak about this before where I say soil solution. So we look at soil and we think, well, that's hard. Well, this is soilless because it's peat, but regardless, we think to ourselves, well, this is hard. It's immobile. It's, it's a structure. It's a physical structure. Am I right? You're wrong. We call this soil solution more often than not. The reason for that is because the soil is a mixture, a hom homogenous mixture of so many different attributes, air, water, nutrients, plastics, and minerals, organics, you name it. And in this, things move, things biodegrade, things are always changing. And what the plant actually cares about is the soil solution. What the microbes care about is the soil solution because that's what that's the world they're living in. My my brain said, okay, how where where are the plastics going? Now they're not water soluble, meaning they're not hitching rides on water molecules and keep being sent up the roots or being you know mobilized around in the soil, which some nutrients are water soluble, and that is how they move around. It's actually you know, passively how they get into the plant roots. You know, osmosis, old grade 12 chemistry, you know the drill. The way that they do move is actually 
through mechanical means, if you will. So wind or physical moving of contaminated soil to non-contaminated soil or water. So water can in mass move soil, call this runoff or erosion. That means with it can go plastic. So either, either horizontally or vertically down into the soil system. Now, the only way in which plants can uptake the micro and the nanoplastic is if the roots are in contact with that, that particle. The way in which they come in contact is through their rhizosphere. So again, I don't mean to get super technical here. If, you, if you're part of the Git crew, most of this, and you've been here for a while, most of this you're like, okay, yeah, I got it, Ashley, but there's new people here. We gotta be nice to them, please. You guys are always nice to them, but regardless. So rhizosphere essentially is uh, the area that the roots can touch. So think of my arms as the, um, or the roots at this point. Everywhere I touch is a part of my rhizosphere. Outside of this, anything I can't touch is not a part of my rhizosphere, meaning if I can't grab it in my vicinity, see I can grab plastics, but if I can't grab it in my general vicinity, I can't uptake it. Plants, same rule. So what that means is if you have a garden in which you've you know, never really used plastic or you're pretty conscious about direct sowing, whatever the case is, do you have a, a micro nanoplastic issue? Probably not unless it's coming through the water, which is very common now as well. So you actually probably do have nanoplastics in your soil because of the water, but I digress. That is how the plants uptake it. Do these make it worse is the question of the day. And it depends. It depends on the plastic. So I decided to look up Canada and US. Is there any regulation as to what numbers need to be on these things? No, there isn't. Only regulation is that it's food safe. Well, I checked all of these including this, they're all food safe. Food safe is defined as, regardless of the microplastics and nanoplastics, it just chooses to release into whatever aqueous or material is in contact with it. Apparently that doesn't matter, but the plant, the, the dyes, for example, um, the materials that make this up are food safe, meaning you can ingest them and you can live as a plastic Barbie doll for the rest of your life. That is what these are made out of. However, out of these food safe materials, there are some materials that are really bad, and then there are some materials that aren't that bad. And the ones that aren't that bad, there are some steps you can take to really make sure that you're not you know, exasperating the issue, if you will. Number one, styrofoam. I don't have styrofoam here, but the Gardening in Canada Facebook group, I have seen your guys' seed, starts, seed starting setups and I, you know, I look at all the comments. I look at all the posts on there. If you guys DM me on Instagram, I'm looking at those. I generally reply to them quite often. And a lot, I see a lot of styrofoam. I never, in a million years, I never thought of styrofoam as being a bad guy. Turns out it's a plastic, which am I living in a fantasy land where I just thought that was like a material unto itself, styrofoam? Turns out it's a plastic and it is like the worst plastic. It, it releases micro and nanoparticles like Oprah in her heyday, literally. It's just, you get a nanoplastic, you get a nanoplastic. It's hor horrific. So if you're concerned about plastics, please stay away from styrofoams because it is insane how much they release. The next one is number one. So that's peat. Peat's a bad dude. Peat is the ones where in grade school, you compressed the water bottle and then you spun the top off to like shoot your enemy in the head. Yeah, that plastic. Turns out that plastic uh, has an expiry date. Now, the expiry date is the expiry date you find on water bottles. It's water expires when it's in a bottle. And the reason it expires is got nothing to do with the water. It has everything to do with the plastic leaching into water. With that being said, there are several studies that have been done on water bottles, on shelves, peat specifically, and peat, the bad guy, on shelves. And there are nanoplastics in the aqueous solutions in which the plastic encases. So peat number one, let's, let's stay away from peat. Peat is at the bottom of the list, you know, just above styrofoam, but still in the same vicinity. So the next one is number two. Now, number two, 
I saw a number two somewhere. That's what the number two is. I forgot about these. All your fertilizer containers, your milk jugs. So that is a plastic that is tough and strong and food safe. And this stuff is known to be used in outdoor settings. So for example, gas tanks on vehicles are very often a number two. It's the HDPE material because it is so resistant to weathering. It's resistant to heat to an extent, cold, sun. It just doesn't degrade easily. So if we were to put one number one, right now anyways, at the top of the list, it would be number two. So milk jugs, actually, if you want to reuse, that is not a bad choice. These are less likely, less likely to have nanoplastics. By how much, I mean, that's up in the air. And here's, a, here's one that's so odd. This is my grandma's watering can. Um, it doesn't, it's made in Canada and it actually doesn't have a number on it. And I bet you it's because this thing is older than the hills and it was probably before plastics had numbers. Does it have nano and microplastics? Yes. Yes, I'm probably getting lots from this. Thank you, grandma. Not only did you pass on DNA, you passed on plastic. Holy sh So this is kind of wild. wild. I've never realized this before, but all of these kind of like cheap, this is like that Amazon one I did. This is that Mr. Bottle from Dollarama. They don't have numbers. I don't know what that means. Probably nothing good if we're being honest, uh, but no numbers on any of these. So maybe they're just, they're plastic free. That's what it is, <laughs> of course. Okay, so the other one is polyvinyl chloride. Don't use it, it's PVC, I mean, they say, they say it's, it's not food safe. The reasoning behind why it's not food safe or why you shouldn't use it, I mean, it's like a whole thing unto itself. So I can do a whole video on PVC and whether or not you'd wanna use it or choose to use it. I just, the irony in it is not lost on me because all our drinking water comes through PVC pipes, particularly in new areas. So I'm just like, how can you not say it's food safe but then put our water through it? I digress. The next one is number four, which is the LDPE, which is a low density polyethylene, which is plastic bags. And that is food safe. So if you wanted to garden in a plastic bag, you technically could, and it would be recommended over PVC, which is very confusing. That one I would not use because that definitely degrades quick. And that definitely has micro and nanoplastics just floating around. Like this is plastic. It doesn't have a number on it, but it's plastic. And it's probably one of the worst plastics. It's probably the plastic bag number. The next one is PP. Yes, PP, polypropylene. And polypropylene is number five. So number five is this Walmart container, this hard, plastic container and the tray, the seed starting tray are all number fives. This, I lied to you, is not a solo cup. It's a no name solo cup from the Dollarama because I was doing the Dollarama video, um, is a number five as well. That is considered food safe. These are also found in like yogurt containers and stuff, for example, so long as they're not degraded. So if you notice color changing, wear and tear, damage, then it may be time to retire that plastic. If you're worried about it, again, if you're worried about it. If we're being totally honest, I'm probably just gonna go and garden in plastic after this, but the number five seems to be very popular, very common, common uh, plastic choice for plant people, so, or plant manufacturers, plant container man manufacturers, so it works, it does, don't get me wrong. Okay, so if this was a real solo cup, it'd be a number six. And I went on Solo Cups website just to prove that it's a six and it is a six. And these beloved containers that I've used for my entire gardening life, like me and my grandma have used these for like 10 years now. Um, they're very nice, very hard plastic. They're a number six too. Number six has a problem. Number six is uh, toxic. Not only, does number six release nanoplastics and microplastics similar to that of which number five and all the ones up until all of them, all of them do. It also releases carcinogenic chemicals, styrene. 
Styrene is the chemical that is released and it is harmful to health and can have carcinogenic effects. Now, the way styrene is released is via heat. So if a number six plastic is heated, it will release that chemical. Meaning if it goes in the microwave, if it is in a hot greenhouse, if it is on a heat mat, I would venture to guess probably not the best. If these aren't exposed to heat, they're actually pretty good. But if you're gonna wash these to reuse them, I would probably wash them in cold water because if you put heat on it, apparently you can get cancer, which is like, I'm done dead serious. When I say that we've gardened and eaten my entire life, I'm like not joking. I'm not joking. So have I ingested a lot of styrene? I don't know. I don't know. It being, these being in a greenhouse is worrisome, worrisome because greenhouses get hot. Should you be worried about microplastics and nanoplastics in your plants? And is there any way in which you can escape them? All of these plastic pods I have release them. This one's less likely to release it, but I mean, over time it gets released too. I don't think, personally, I don't think you should stress about it. Not because I think that these things aren't harmful, the reason why I say don't stress about it is because your water source that you're watering your plants with, if it's not rainwater, and even if it is rainwater, I mean, I'll Google, I'll look up. If it, if it isn't rainwater, I'll put something there to say it is or not. If it's not, your plants are uptaking it regardless because it's in the water. Now, what I would stay away from are the number sixes because that is terrifying. So number six is this container. And actually the, the solo cups, like the name brand solo cups, this one, the Dollarama ones are actually safer than the name brand ones. Stuff to think about. Didn't mean to ruin your day or anything, but I'm here to give you the truth. I, what's the solution? I don't have it. I'm stumped on this. Thanks for watching. Comment down below if you care about microplastics, nanoplastics, and all the plastics in the world. And I'll talk to you guys next time. Bye.